Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session. I'm one of the two speakers here. My name is Yu Hao. The other speaker is Supan. He will cover the second half of this talk. We will talk about our research project called Cerebro. It's a data system for resource efficient deploying model selection. It can support multiple model selection algorithms as well as various backends. Spark is one of the backends we support. The software is open sourced and publicly available. So if you find it interesting, please do try it yourself. A little bit of self-introduction. We are PhD students from University of California, San Diego, and advised by Professor Arun Kumar. Our research mission is to democratize data science by making it dramatically easier, faster, and cheaper to build and deploy ML and AI applications. You can find more about us on our websites. Now, let's get started. Artificial neural networks, or better known as deep learning, are revolutionizing many, many domains, such as machine translation, autonomous driving, or even critical domains like health and medicine. So probably you're already considering using deep learning in your next project. But there's a problem. Training a deep net is not trivial. Deep learning models are highly nonlinear and still largely remain a black box to the user. As a result, your model performance depends on several factors such as model architectures and hyperparameters in a very complex way. Model architecture such as CNN, RNN is how you define your model. Hyperparameters like learning rate, batch size are knobs that can affect the learning process and the final outcome in a very profound way. Together, these are the model configurations you have to decide before actually training anything. And it's difficult to know which combination of these parameters is the best beforehand. As a result, you often need to run model selection and hyperparameter tuning on a trial and error basis. For each model config, you will need to train one model. Later, you can pick the best model and the number of models you need to train quickly explodes because you have so many choices. That's one pain of deep learning. You don't just train one model, usually you have to train dozens, if not hundreds of models. In this example, we have model architectures, batch size, learning reads, as well as regularizations to train. Although we have only four choices for each of them, we still end up with over 200 models to train. And the training could be very slow. It can take days to just train one model, let alone 200. We desperately need speed. We need to increase the throughput of model selection. And the solution to it, quite unfortunately and not surprisingly, is money. Distributed deep learning. You purchase more machines, you scale up your cluster so you can have more computational power. At the meantime, you will need to better utilize your machines. Otherwise, they sit idle and your money is wasted. This is where our system can come in to help. We can help you best utilize your machines and ultimately save your money. Here is the agenda. I will first cover some backgrounds and the existing solutions to the problem. Then we'll present you with our system and our core technique, MOP. It stands for Mother Hopper Parallelism. Then Supan will take over and talk about the implementation of MOP on Spark. Before we move on, first thing you need to know is how we actually train a model on just one machine. The most popular choice of training algorithm is Minibatch SGD. It works as follows. Here you have your data set, nine rows, three columns. What the algorithm does is it first batches some rows of your data and updates your model based on the gradients calculated from this minibatch. Then it takes another minibatch, it updates again and again. In the end, your model has visited all data and this is called one epoch. 
The whole training process usually takes multiple epochs before your model finally converges. This is the core tech, uh, core data access pattern of Minibatch SGD. This process, as you can see, is inherently sequential. That's one of the reasons why running this in a parallel and distributed manner is so interesting. Now you know locally how a model is trained. Let's get back to our problem, which is training multiple models with Minibatch SGD on the same data set on multiple machines. Well, take a second and think about how would you actually do it? Well, the most naive way to me is to copy your data around to each machine and you have machines with replicated data sets. Later, I just send one model to one machine and let the machines train locally in isolation. And I get my trained models in the end. This is of course embarrassingly easy and embarrassingly parallel. Well, it's great, huh? But there's a problem. What if your data set is so large that it doesn't fit in a single node's memory or even the storage? And remember, the data set is replicated and that's wastage, which is not good. Well, you can always use a shared file system to bypass this issue. But instead of storage, you're wasting network this time because your workers need to do remote reads now. This solves one problem, introduces another, which is still not good. All right, question is, can we do something to mitigate this issue? This leads us to another branch of the research, data parallelism. In this scheme, you have models, but this time you have partition data. Each worker has only a part of the data set, so you cannot fully train a model on a single node anymore. Here is how data parallelism works. In this scheme, you train one model at a time. You first send the model to your workers. And the workers train the model with their local data. And the master node collects updates and modifies the global model accordingly. This process then repeats. There are several flavors of it. If you collect updates only per epoch, then it's called model averaging. Unfortunately, model averaging can have serious convergence issues as it's not equivalent to sequential SGD anymore. Or you could update per minibatch, which is equivalent to sequential SGD. This is known as synchronous parameter server. You can make it asynchronous. You can make it decentralized. But all of these approaches suffer from high communication cost because communications take place every minibatch. And there could be tens of thousands of minibatches per epoch, which is not good either. To recap, so far we have seen Task parallelism, it has high throughput, but low data scalability and has wastage. On the other hand, we have data parallelism, which is very scalable, but has low throughput because of the high communication cost. A natural question is, can we combine the advantages of both, but somehow leave the disadvantages behind? The answer is yes, the result is model hopper parallelism and Cerebro, our software system that implements it. It has high throughput, high data scalability, low communication cost, no storage wastage, everything you want in one box. The secret to it is model hopper parallelism or MAP in short. It's a new type of parallelism that combines the benefits of task and data parallelism. The problem setting is identical to data parallelism. We have models and partitioned data. Map works as follows. First step, we allocate one model to one worker, just like task parallelism. And we train the models on the full local partitions, just like 
model averaging. This is what we call one sub epoch. Next is the key to everything and the reason why this is called model hopper. We hop the models around and resume training on the next workers. Models get updated and we hop again. At the end of the day, you can see each model has visited all data in sequential manner so that they can converge fast. This whole process is equivalent to one epoch. Besides, we only communicate per sub-epoch instead of per minibatch so that we can keep communication cost low. Data is partitioned and there's no wastage. Basically everything we have asked before. Here is our system, Cerebro, which implements MOP. It has this narrow waste architecture that supports various model search and auto ML procedures like PBT and Hyperban, as well as multiple deploying systems and execution backends. For deploying, we, supports, we support TensorFlow, PyTorch. For backends, we have Spark, Greenplum database, and also a standalone version of Cerebro. In this talk, we will focus on TensorFlow with Spark. Now, please welcome my co-presenter, Supan. He will talk about the implementation and details of Cerebro and MOP on Spark. Thank you. Okay, so let's look into some of implementation details of Cerebro on top of Apache Spark. We have implemented Cerebro Scheduler and Cerebro Workers as a Spark job. Cerebro Scheduler runs inside the Spark driver and Cerebro Workers run inside Spark Workers. As the underlying deep learning framework, we use TensorFlow. Currently, for the data storage layer, we support two different flavors, HDFS and NFS. Cerebro takes in input data in the form of Spark data frames and converts them to partition parquet files and locally cache individual partitions inside workers. To achieve this, underneath we use the Petastorm library. Using TensorFlow, we train models only on the locally available partition of the data. And in order to achieve model hopping, we use a shared file system, which is either HDFS or NFS. Now let's look into some details about Cerebro's APIs. As a running example, I use the popular ImageNet dataset and do grid search for performing a model selection plus hyperparameter search work. I explore two different model architectures, two learning rates, and two different batch sizes. The first step is the initialization step. As usual, you import your regular Python imports and you also import Cerebro. Then you initialize your Spark session and then create a Cerebro Spark backend object, providing the Spark context and the number of workers for Cerebro as the input. Then you create a Cerebro HDFS store object for HDFS based storage, providing a prefix path to a directory, which will be used to store all the intermediate data that will be generated during the model selection process. After the initialization, you can define the models. The first thing you need to do is to define the parameter search space by defining a dictionary object, which has all the configuration parameters and the potential values for each of those parameters. We also provide APIs for defining more complex search spaces, such as the ones that use random sampling. Next, you need to define this factory method, which is called estimator generator function, which takes in a specific instance of the search space and returns a Cerebro Spark estimator. Cerebro Spark estimator has a reference to a Keras model, the learning optimizer, the loss function that needs to be used, and also the batch size for mini batch based training. After defining the models, you can then run grid search. First, you need to initialize your input data frame using any method you like and optionally performing any ETL in order to make the data amenable for deep learning training. Then you need to create Cerebro grid search object, providing the Spark backend, the data store, the estimated generator function, 
parameter space as input. You also need to provide several other parameters like how many epochs you want to train each model for, the fraction of the data that you need to use for model validation, and the names of the feature columns and the label columns. This grid search object is very similar to any other Spark ML model, and you can invoke the model selection process by calling the fit method and providing the input data frame. After successful completion, it will re return a summary object, which you can use to access the best model and also all the other models that were explored during the model selection process. During model selection, you can visualize the training progress of all the models, either using TensorBoard or MLflow. Next, let's look into some experimental results. As the experimental setup, I use a nine node cluster, which has one master node and eight worker nodes. Each node has an Intel Xeon processor, 192 gigabytes of RAM, and one NVIDIA P100 GPU. As the experimental workload, I use the same ImageNet workload that I explained earlier and use Adam as the optimizer. Furthermore, I explore two different values for L2 regularization, essentially generating 16 different model configurations for this workload. Here, I show the learning curves for the different systems that we experimented. The x-axis shows the epoch number, which ranges from one to 10, and the y-axis shows the top five validation error, which is the standard metric for evaluating models trained on ImageNet data. Cerebro standalone is our version of Cerebro, which directly runs on data files that are available on the file system. In terms of convergence, we see TensorFlow model averaging converges very poorly as expected. Forward converges better than TensorFlow model averaging, but slightly worse than other systems. The reason for this is its high effective mini batch size. All the other systems, TensorFlow parameter server asynchronous, Celery, which is the task parallel system, Cerebro standalone, and Cerebro Spark converge similarly. In terms of per epoch runtimes, we see TensorFlow parameter survey asynchronous takes around 19 hours to complete one epoch of training of this workload. Forward takes around 5.42 hours. The reason for high runtimes of these systems is their high communication overheads. All the other systems complete this workload in a relatively low runtime, around 1.7 to 1.9 hours. However, it should be noted that even though Celery has low runtime, it has a storage footprint, which has a blown up factor of 8x. And even though TensorFlow model averaging has low runtime, it converges very poorly. Another important thing to note here is that the requirements of deep learning model training significantly differs from the requirements of a typical data processing workload on Spark. And as a result, when running Cerebro on top of Spark, Spark has to be configured in a way such that it is optimized for deep learning training. How to configure Spark for Cerebro can be found in the documentations of our system. Here I show the GAN chart produced for the first epoch of training for Cerebro Spark. Each color uniquely identifies a different model configuration and you can see how models hop between different workers in order to complete one epoch of training. You can also see how the system achieves high system utilization, having very little idle times between model hoppings. In addition to grid search, we also support several other hyperparameter tuning algorithms, such as population-based tuning, hyperband, ASHA, and hyperop. We are also currently working on several other features in Cerebro, such as support for group learning, APIs for transfer learning, and also model parallelism. If you're interested in learning more about Cerebro Spark, you can check our project website. The code is also open sourced under Apache license and can be accessed on GitHub. If you're more interested about the technical details about Cerebro or Mop, you can check our blog post or the tech report. With that, I would like to conclude and take any questions if you have.